An article from Planning Magazine states that one-third of American households are made up of a single individual. Up to 85% of households will not include children by 2025. By 2030, one in five Americans will be over the age of 65. Demand is high for smaller homes, lower living costs, walkable neighborhoods, and places for people to age in place. Recent historical events are rapidly changing our housing landscape and demand for all types of housing. As inflation starts to cool the nationwide housing market, our local market continues to experience strong demand and increasing prices due to our economic successes. Building more dens densely solves some issues. More homes on less land, cost less to build the same amount of homes, and providing services is more efficient. However, density next to existing housing is one of the most controversial issues we see with zone changes. Affordability is another big question. As homes become more expensive and less affordable, it increases the demand for apartments, which drives up rents. This creates a difficult balance for our housing equation. So where do we put density? What form should it come in? How do we keep housing costs affordable and provide a good supply of workforce in low-income housing? These questions will need to be considered when making local housing land use decisions in the years to come. For session eight, we'll be covering our housing and neighborhoods element of the FOCUS 2030 comprehensive plan. Uh, before we go over our goals and objectives for this element, we will look at some of the recent articles, uh, media coverage on the growth in Warren County, the recent population projections were released by the Kentucky State Data Center at University of Louisville, and uh, Director Matt uh, Ruther, Ruther, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but uh, basically said that our county is projected to uh, grow rapidly and our growth will be second only to Lexington Fayette County and it'll be a close second, mostly due to our economic opportunities and uh, our location. Uh, and that how we're well po poised for this type of growth, uh, having uh, WKU, uh, being on I-65 between Louisville and Nashville, and we're just kind of well positioned and ready for this growth. Um, and the article goes on to say that if these reports calculations pan out, we would surpass Kenton and Boone counties. If you're not familiar with that area, that's basically uh, the, sense, uh, the good side of Cincinnati, the Kentucky side of Cincinnati and we would become the third most populous county by 2050. So a tremendous growth. Looking specifically at the population and those projections that were released, I'll start down here in this uh, section here talking about just the population change. Uh, we uh, had a percent change from 2020 10 to 10 years, 23% growth. That's uh, uh, incredible growth. Um, and where did that growth come from? Uh, some of it's just our natural increase. So um, our, low, our existing local citizens uh, grew by 6,306, so having lots of babies essentially. Uh, but then in migration, so net migration from people outside of Warren County moving to Warren County, that's where the largest part of that growth is that makes up those almost 21,000 people increase that happened from 2010 to 2020, that 10 year period. Looking at the top uh, chart, the population projections that are referenced, uh, just note that uh, 2020 population currently about 134, 135,000 people. Uh, by 2050, we're looking at over 200, 210,000 uh, people. Uh, and then you look at uh, our households increase as well. Currently 51, somewhere around 51,000 households, 30,000 household increase. Uh, and over the next 30 years, population again, we're looking at about uh, 2,000 to 2,500 people every year on average, uh, tends to come in waves. Uh, and then you look at our household size, uh, was projected to go down and now it's uh, projected to remain relatively flat. 
at about uh, two and a half people per household. Just looking at some of the quick facts, this is a copy straight out of our Housing and Neighborhood Elements, uh, page HN1, uh, and just kind of updating some of those quick facts that we can see. So housing occupies more land in Warren County than any other use except for agriculture. Of course, that's still true. Uh, looking at our housing stock, uh, we are at almost 58,000 housing units, and that's as a 2020 census. Again, a quick note about the 2020 census. All the data was gathered in 2019, so it's almost three years old. So I would say we're, we've already surpassed these numbers uh, fairly easily. Um, occupancy uh, data has not quite, uh, occupancy and vacancy uh, information is not quite uh, released yet, so we're still waiting on that. Um, Looking at uh, owner-occupied uh, versus renter-occupied dwelling units, so we have almost 58% are owner-occupied dwelling units countywide. In Bowling Green, it's right at 40% owner-occupied. Uh, looking at renter-occupied countywide, 42% renter-occupied, about 61% rental uh, renter-occupied units in the city of Bowling Green. So the city's about 61% rental uh, in the, as of the 2020 census. Uh, next bullet, vacancy rates weren't, again, aren't quite available yet. Uh, moving on down, uh, average household size, we already mentioned as 2.41 persons. Well, that's now moved up to about two and a half uh, people per household. You look at our median value of uh, owner-occupied homes, was 130,000, now we're up to 180,000 and increasing. And again, that's the median value of home. Think of, think of that as more of the assessed value of all homes in the county and not necessarily what the sale price is because the sale prices are um, much higher than that. Average sale price is, uh, is approaching um, 220,000 dollars or more uh, for the homes for sale um, but they're valued uh, the, the, the value again this is as of three years ago at this point uh, was right around 108,000 so it's still still going up and then the median rent was 592 uh, dollars a month that was in 2009 well now we're uh, 822 dollars and climbing and uh, as we learned in the previous session, I believe it was session two, uh, where we went over a lot of statistics, uh, you'll see that our average rents uh, that we found are actually over clo closer to 900 a month now. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, still rapidly growing, rapidly increasing, uh, creates some challenges we'll talk about here in just a minute. Uh, but uh, rents are increasing at about 3% a year, uh, year after year. Uh, and then they mention uh, our uh, residential dominated historic districts uh, and our historic districts, and those, those have remained the same uh, over the past 10 years. So what are some of our housing challenges? There are many, uh, and it is complex, and it's rapidly evolving and changing every day. Um, I bet our one of our biggest housing challenges in this community is just increasing increasing our supply, increasing the number of houses available. Uh, and I say houses, but it's our units. So both, that includes both apartments and uh, houses. Um, not unlike many other commodities in our economy, it's uh, ba basic supply and demand. Uh, if you can increase the supply of housing, uh, and that can meet or exceed the demand, then you'll see um, the houses, housing prices level off or maybe even drop in some, some respects. But it, so it's a lot more complicated than that simple statement. But prior to the tornado, we were already in a housing crunch. Uh, we needed around 1,000 to 1,200 units a year uh, just to meet our existing demand. Um, supply chain issues have slowed build times, which is kind of uh, 
not hurt us not being able to keep up with demand. Uh, we lost around 500 housing units to the tornado, um, although we have recovered several uh, and and continue to recover recover those uh, much faster than than other communities. Um, but our but that leaves us with the challenge of now how to build closer to 1,500 to 2,500 units a year, if not maybe even 3,000 a year. Uh, it's certainly in, in, the, in the short to medium term in today's construction climate. Uh, we've just had some several large um, industrial announcements, including a really big one, which uh, 2,000 more jobs. Uh, we're gonna, th that's gonna require importing of more human capital and even more uh, people to uh, Bowling Green, Warren County area, if not in the county itself, and that will uh, increase the demand for housing, uh, services, and, and a whole lot of other things. So growth is not without its challenges. Um, so moving along to the next point was just bu the building supply chain. Uh, it was constrained prior to the tornado, continues to be constrained, um, and it's uh, through all parts of the in uh, construction industry, random weird things, whether it be water pipe pieces or pieces to an electrical box or conduit or uh, in any number of things have been a, a affected by that supply chain. Again, slowing down that construction, um, not having uh, those houses uh, ready as fast as they were to be occupied. Um, and but if it seems like we're on the edge of, uh, if not already into a nationwide slowdown, uh, that may actually increase uh, building supply chain, so building materials to our area and, because they will be simply available. So that may, may help us. I don't think that it is yet, but we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, and then affordability, always a big issue. Um, I think a couple things to, to mention is that the agencies that use census numbers uh, or, or that provide funding or that provide uh, set rental assistance rates, um, uh, FEMA during the tornado, uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development, uh, any other normal time, those numbers that they use may not reflect our current market because it's changing so fast. Um, we have uh, three, you know, they're, they use generally the same census numbers and their projected updates. Again, those are always usually two or three years behind and those numbers uh, being behind uh, as fast as we're growing are, are really can uh, hurt us in providing uh, the, the needed assistance to our underserved populations. Um, and then of course, inflation, it's made it even harder to afford a home as we're having to spend more on uh, gas and groceries and, and so on. So um, hopefully that'll be short lived, uh, but it seems like prices uh, never go all the way back down to what they were before and that will maintain a higher level. So higher transportation costs, higher food costs, higher shelter costs, all of that uh, affects everyone's bottom line, makes it harder to afford a home. Um, so other, other points, uh, you'll you may hear, you'll hear me say a lot, a uh, variety of pot price points and a variety of locations, variety of housing types at a variety of price points and a variety of locations. Um, so variety of price points, um, we need, uh, low income housing. We need workforce housing. We need the missing middle, you can Google that term, uh, missing middle housing, if you wanna learn more, but it's kind of the squeezing out of that, that middle class housing, uh, the affordable, uh, the, that affordable product for the, for the middle class, and then the higher income housing. So we obviously need lot, all of those as a society. Um, the types of housing, of course, you have your two main types, a single family and multifamily, but single family, um, some, there's some products that we traditionally haven't seen here, but we're starting to see uh, in our local area. Uh, we have our traditional detached single family housing. So your typical neighborhood where you have your four walls and a roof and that's completely separate. 
separated by yards to your neighbor, four walls and a roof. Uh, we now have attached single family uh, where you might have two homes that share a middle wall or, or maybe even more, maybe up to four homes. Uh, some some, some townhomes are, are sometimes like that. And then condos where you share walls and possibly ceilings and floors and, and other things. So uh, where you own your described part of your uh, building uh, and then the rest is in common ownership. So we're starting to see a few more types, uh, some out of desire as we get more people moving here from areas that are used to those types of housing, but also um, just out of necessity maybe because some of those other types of housing is more affordable. Then multifamily, of course we have our traditional apartments, but something we've seen is uh, I guess detached apartments may be the best term, but it, just think of maybe a single family homes uh, detached as described in your traditional neighborhood, maybe a little closer together than you're used to, but there's no lot lines. So uh, you, owe, you uh, would rent that footprint. It might be a home, but it would be on one lot with many other homes. So we have a couple of several examples of that in our community. Density is a huge challenge, uh, and it's a challenge on both ends. So uh, higher density, a lot of times, is good planning practice. It puts more houses on the same land. Um, so you actually uh, use less land for the same number of houses would be another way of saving it. It is a way to, um, I guess, help control uh, the spread of housing. Um, you, when you have the houses on, on less amount of land. But it's also one, uh, and it's all, uh, let me finish that point. It also is easier from a government perspective and a service perspective to uh, serve those with sidewalks and garbage pickup and and so on and so forth. So, you, so uh, they're closer together. You don't have as many vehicle miles traveled to pick up the garbage, let's say. The second part of that is though that it's also the most controversial land use items, um, um, issues that we have. So uh, and when you have existing housing stock and you wanna put uh, sometimes smaller but more dense development next to lots that are say on half acre and you wanna go with uh, less than a quarter acre lots, putting those next to existing housing stock is often um, uh, met with uh, met with some some resistance and sometimes strong resistance. So, which leads to the next thing's location. So, where do we put all of these housing types? We know we have the need, but the question is always, well, if not there, then where? So, where do we put these different types uh, of of housing? Uh, and again, that goes back to that that location, variety of price points, and a variety of locations. And a, the variety of types. So uh, it's always going to be a challenging decision uh, uh, and, and thought process for the decision makers when deciding those things. And the last point is amenities. There's different as expectations now as society has changed of what is desired with those housing unit types. Closer together, um, maybe smaller yards, uh, connections to parks, to sidewalks, being walkable, all of those uh, things uh, are now a, uh, at least in my mind, a greater desire than they probably were uh, what they used to be when you had maybe larger yard, one acre lot, those types of things. So moving along to look at our goal uh, and, and the objectives for our housing and neighborhoods element. So the goal is to meet the demand for residential options that are affordable and integrated into vibrant neighborhoods and diverse districts. Looking at A at first one, HN1, promote the development of infill sites with existing urban services and suitable redevelopment projects that maintain or improve existing character development patterns and urban design. So a lot of talk about mixed use developments, um, meaning there might be some commercial service type uh, uh, uses at the front of a neighborhood 
and then all and then a, maybe a variety of housing types or even just a, a traditional neighborhood mixed in with that uh, and then uh, and then infill would be um, one of two uh, things typically uh, are thought of when when that is mentioned infill development it would be filling in gaps so let's say we had a, a neighborhood that was a quarter of a mile away from the next neighborhood well in between there going back and filling that uh, with neighborhoods to kind of connect that more into a suburban uh, development pattern another would be uh, existing neighborhoods any vacant houses lots uh, vacant lots where houses have been torn down or maybe a redevelopment of a block or a half block or something would be uh, infill. So trying to improve on that character. Um, in some cases, if it's a historic district, not lose that character. Other cases um, might be uh, just a whole new redevelopment. So it's case by case basis. But again, promoting development where infrastructure already exists. HN2, established programs to maintain and improve the quality of housing stock. Uh, Planning Commission in very recent times has uh, upped the, uh, I guess, building material quality uh, requirements and the things they ask for. Um, but uh, I think we have to be careful with how much of that we do because sometimes we uh, could increase prices in that regard as well. So I think we, uh, again, try to figure out that balance. HN3, protect, revitalize, a redevelopment redevelop older residential neighborhoods as identified on the neighborhood stability and revitalization map while protecting and enhancing newer residential neighborhoods. So I think we need to probably strike a little bit of this sentence because uh, there is an, uh, the neighborhood stability and revitalization map that was originally intended to go in the conference of plan was taken out but yet some the statement remained in. So uh, we still obviously need to protect, revitalize, or redevelop our older neighborhoods, uh, but we just uh, don't have that uh, that map anymore. Um, and this is one where we've probably fallen short uh, as a community over the past few years, but um, unfortunately, you know, we had the tragedy of the tornado, but it also gave us the opportunity to take a look at some of our older neighborhoods and protect and enhance um, and in some cases revitalize those and get some things in place. So hopefully we can use that as a model to continue and in fact do have plans to continue um, kind of looking at neighborhoods, uh, looking at the existing character and then making sure that zoning matches those neighborhoods. Looking at HN4, encourage an array of housing options in all parts of Warren County. Um, and, you know, a lot has talked about the rapid development in the south, which is absolutely going on. I uh, believe we'll see some of that in, expand into maybe the northern part of the county, but uh, all parts of the county is certainly uh, all encompassing, and we need to make sure we are keeping that in perspective. Uh, again, our array of housing types, not just one particular traditional subdivision type. Uh, ensure that housing stock is affordable to all segments of the current and future population. Um, again, extremely difficult in this uh, current uh, economy uh, and a current market, but we've got to, um, you know, doing nothing is not really an option in my opinion. I think we need to keep uh, looking at ways to try to keep our housing as affordable as possible and provide uh, unique housing opportunities for specific populations that, that need uh, need that help in, in, that, in the affordable housing, mostly in the realm of workforce housing and then our uh, housing for uh, the working poor and for uh, the people who need subsidized housing. HN6 uh, is to provide for the housing needs of the elderly, disabled, and those in need of transitional housing. I'll just take this uh, opportunity to quickly mention we've had at least one expansion of elderly housing and two new projects, uh, one currently under construction 
and another that has just been approved that will hopefully be under construction soon. Uh, I think those are a good start and, and looking at uh, those housing needs for that, that particular elderly population anyway. Uh, disabled, I think, uh, and those in need of transitional housing, I think we need to continue to look for ways to uh, provide more of those, those types of housing. So uh, making some progress there, but uh, we can always, always do better. So that kind of concludes uh, our overview of our housing and neighborhoods element, along with a quick um, maybe update of statistics. Um, so what's up next? Uh, we're looking to have, or we are having, a housing element public input meeting. That'll be Monday, September 19th at 5.30 p.m. in the Neighborhood and Community Services Community Room. That's at 701 East Main Avenue, top of Hospital Hill by the Water Tower. Again, if you just go to the lower entrance, or the main entrance at the back of the building, the kind of that lower parking lot, it'll just be go through those double doors and it'll be the room on your, on your right. So uh, that's what's coming up. And then in October, uh, we will start on our future land use element and uh, start taking a look at some of our recommendations for changes for our future land use element and kind of go over that. So that will be our last element uh, that we'll go over and then uh, we'll be looking to November, December for our um, recommended changes and adoption process.